Um, I am Chris Nova, and I climb mountains. Um, but before we talk about anything else, uh, I'm going to let you guys know a little bit about me. Uh, and I like to say I'm queer first. And the reason I say that is because I'm a lot of things, and usually when I'm giving a, a talk, this is the point where I'm like, I've written a book, and I've done all this cloud native stuff, and I've, you know, contributed to these meaningful open source projects before. Um, but as I do all that, it's always important because I'm queer first. I'm a queer software engineer, I'm a queer mountaineer, I'm a queer dog mom. Um, so my whole life, I've uh, gone through these things that I like to call cycles of destruction. Um, and it's sort of like this sine wave that you'll watch kind of go up and down, and sometimes I'll be up on the top, and other times I kind of go down and crash. We're going to be going through two of these cycles of destruction, uh, and tell you a little bit about my past, and then we're going to plug that into software today, and, and how that all kind of plays together. When I was 12 years old, I was grounded from the Linux operating system. Uh, <laughs> the reason for that was because I had accidentally installed it on my parents' computer and reformatted their hard drive. My parents were so upset they lost tax information and mortgage information, uh, and they grounded me from running open source software in the house. So naturally, that became my obsession. Um, I ran Linux in college, and I started writing my first programs in college. I, I wrote a program that would send Git requests to our online uh, textbook resource and grep through the, the data to look for homework answers. I was really proud of this, and I told people. Um, I was later kicked out of college for doing that. Um, so they put me on academic probation. Uh, I didn't take that very well. Um, I still loved Linux. But after I was, my college career came to an end, I ended up homeless. And uh, this picture here, I, I forgot to mention it at the beginning, all of these pictures uh, are pictures that I took uh, from mountains that I've climbed. Uh, so this is from Mount Rainier. These two people have, were just stuck in an avalanche and they just came out. Um, so anyway, I was homeless. And here's a picture of me uh, smoking a cigarette. That was uh, actually, I think, uh, vodka in that water bottle. Um, and that was me when I was sleeping on the streets. So later in life, uh, I was able to move to Colorado. I was given an opportunity to start working. Um, I was very naive at this point in my life. I thought I kind of could do anything. I thought it was invincible. Um, but I still use Linux. As I went through Colorado, uh, pre-transition, as a male, um, I wouldn't say I necessarily thrived as much as I survived. It was very much a defensive place to be, but every once in a while I did find an opportunity to go do something that I loved. This is a picture of the, me and my friend Matt and my, my dog Charlie on the top of Mount Evans in Colorado. So as we go through the slide, we're going to look at some slides like this. Um, on one side we see self-worth, and on the other side we see software. And as you learn about me and my life and my transition, we're going to kind of be comparing these two things as I go through this, this process of learning who I really am and, and uh, discovering what I'm really made of. Uh, so at this point in my life, like I had mentioned, I, I was living in Colorado pre-transition, um, and I didn't really even realize self-worth was a thing. I would say emotional intelligence at this point in my life was a zero. Uh, I was very reactive, and I didn't really have a concept of, of who I was and how I valued myself. Um, my software at this point, I didn't even realize I was writing software. I remember uh, somebody had said, like, Chris, remember that thing you did on your computer and like stole all the homework answers? And I was like, oh yeah, that was just like the program I wrote. And then later, somebody had said, yeah, that was some software Chris had written. And I was like, what do you mean? I don't, I'm not, I don't write software, I just use Linux, right? Um, so after using Linux, I was... Uh, inevitably given a job, my first job working at an e-commerce company, and I did a lot of object-oriented PHP. So here you can see uh, this, and then we call this fantastically named method. Um, but what I think is important here is this paradigm behind what I was doing as a newly discovered software engineer. Remember that this is a point in my life where I was like, oh, I write software. I'm really cool now. Uh, so a lot of, of what I did was reactive. When I say reactive, I mean it was sort of in response to um, problems usually caused from other software written by somebody else or my previous self, like you know, six months prior. Uh, so here's a really great snippet of code. I actually went on GitHub and found this. I wrote this like six years ago. Uh, and if you, for the 
stuff on the left here, it says I abstracted abstractions abstractly. And if you look at the code, it looks really pretty. Uh, it's got a really nice back block, and it's got some really beautiful params, and it says it returns some stuff, and if you actually go look at the content of the function, um, it's like an if statement, and that's pretty much it. But if you look, it's not really doing anything. Like, we really don't understand what this function is doing. We just see that it's pretty, and that it's calling other functions that are probably equally as big. So at this point in my life, I have my first job. Again, I'm in a survival point. Uh, I'm not really thriving or learning or getting better. I'm just kind of writing code. Uh, so for my self-worth here, I put, at this point I kind of think I'm God. Uh, I'm really in this really weird delusional state where my code is the greatest code to ever walk the earth. And really, I was just another tech bro at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of this pride in my software was false because I wasn't really accomplishing anything. I was just writing pretty characters. Um, so over on the right we have software. It says it looked great, which it did, but it was actually shit because it didn't really do anything. Um, and again, it was all reactive. It was, you know, in place to solve problems that was created by other bad code. So my first job did not do so well because we had a bunch of software engineers who were also getting around writing reactive code and fixing bugs all the time. Uh, the company uh, eventually went bankrupt. So I lost my job. I was laid off. Um, I also lost my partner. She uh, she left me uh, shortly after we uh, the company went under. Uh, and at this point in my life, I lost my family. Uh, I was, again, very ar arrogant and conceited, and I didn't really have a concept of who I was or what I needed to be or who I wanted to be. Uh, and that came out in the form of me disowning my family. Uh, at this point in my life, I totally lost sobriety. I was doing a ton of drugs, uh, like more drugs than you guys want to know. It was really embarrassing. Uh, and I reached this point when I was living in a house in Pine, Colorado, where I like to think I went genuinely insane. Uh, at this point in my life, I had lost all my furniture, my house was completely empty, and I was living on a towel. I slept on a towel every night next to my dog. Uh, the house was empty, uh, my power was, was shut off, and I had a wood-burning stove. And literally, if I, if I wanted to see at night, I would have to light a fire, which usually required seeing to do that. So that was really hard, and I had to engineer that. Um, but anyway, it says this really sorted state of mind usually occurring as a specific disorder. So I thought I had discovered what this disorder was. Um, I became obsessed with this philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche, who has this concept called Ubermacht, which is German for Superman. It's where the term came from. It was my idea that as a man that I was at the time, if I was harder on myself and put myself into more misery, I would eventually become a better person and I would solve all these problems, like reconnecting with my family and getting a job. And, becoming a better person. So I started to beat myself up and intentionally torture myself every night. It got to the point where I created a torture room where I would lay in this room and do drugs and surround myself with things that scared me. And I thought this was good for me. I bought a gun and it didn't work. I woke up the next morning, I got on the internet, I met someone in an IRC chat room and I mumbled the following phrase for the first time in my life. I am transgender. The very next thing I did was I went to github.com and I deleted my old account. And I created Chris Nova, K-R-I-S. I changed the spelling of my first name. Nova was a recommendation from a friend of mine who said that if I ever committed to open source projects, they would take the first letter of my first name and my last name and flip them together. So my name would be Nova with a second K. The first time I ever said the phrase, I think this is cute, was looking at Octokitty on GitHub. And that was a very hard day for me, and I remember it like it was yesterday. This is me in a Jurassic Park t-shirt that says, it's a Unix system, I know this. After one month on HRT, I like to call this the Justin Bieber phase. <laughs> at this point in my life, I hated who I was, but I loved who I was becoming. And my software was starting to reflect that as, as well. When I was writing software at work, I had a new job at this point um, as, as a male, um, but I didn't want it to last, and I wanted it to be pretty. I was proud of it, and I wanted it to be good, and I was sort of relearning what good software meant, and I just knew that I wanted it to be the best. So I started doing DevOps. This is me, my first day as a woman in tech. Uh, it was a very exciting day for me, and this was a really silly picture I took in the parking lot after I got my hair dyed. Anyway, uh, I started 
getting them to DevOps because I like helping people. So I wrote Python, I managed a lot of virtual machines, and I started to write a lot of Bash. While I was on this team as DevOps, I started to connect with people for the first time in my life. 27 years, I had lied, I was a chameleon, I changed into whatever the background wanted me to be so I could blend in, but I never really knew who I was. This was the first time in my life I really started to make true friends. We would make jokes in IRC, we would have fun with the agile process. They learned about the software I wrote and they would use it. And I would ask them what they thought about when they used it, and they would give me feedback. Sometimes the feedback was, Chris, it sucks. <laughs> this is a Python script they wrote. Um, at that job when I was working DevOps, and I wrote it for a friend. Um, he was frustrated with the amount of servers he had to keep in order to SSH in to diagnose something or fix a problem. So I wrote a program that would cache his SSH configuration locally on his hard disk, and he wouldn't have to remember all the server information anymore. I did not write this code for myself. I did not write this code for business. I did not write this code for money. I wrote this code for Dave. So for it. I'm starting to love myself. I'm more proud of the code that I wrote for Dave than I was for any other code I've written in my life. I think he's the only one who used it. You can go to the Python repositories today and hit install it, and I think there's been like four downloads. Um, but regardless, I'm very proud of that code, and I love that code, and I loved myself for writing that code. And I started to connect with people. To this day, Dave is one of my good friends. So my code is starting to solve problems for people, and people are running my code, and people are starting to depend on my code. In fact, six months ago, Dave messaged me on Twitter and said, Hey, Chris, I found a bug in KSSH. Version 1.1. I'm very proud of myself, and I'm proud of the work that I do. The reason I'm proud of it is because I started to write code for people, and I eventually started to write code for a lot of people. I'm now a Kubernetes maintainer. This is one of the biggest open source projects that are being adopted today, and there are companies who I literally watched form a product around code that I've written for free on my GitHub and they're not trying to monetize on it. All of this because I woke up one morning and started to love myself and be proud of the code that I was writing because I knew humans would use it and I wanted that experience to be positive. I am also uh, in the Go author's file. I also wrote a book called Cloud Native Infrastructure, which we mentioned before, or co-authored a book, I should say. Um, again, all of this is a reflection of like me kind of being addicted to loving myself. Like I, I can't stop. Like now it's like this name, Chris Nova, that started out as a GitHub repo after I almost killed myself. It's now something I'm, I'm really proud of. And I can't get enough of, of trying to be better and challenge myself and push myself. So the lesson here for me was I am good enough for me. And my software was good enough for me. There's a, a saying when Bob Marley was asked, First, somebody had mentioned to Bob Marley uh, that they didn't like the way he sang, and his response was, well, I'm not singing for you, because he was singing for himself. I like to think of my software the same way. I'm not writing software for anyone, I'm writing it for myself, and I'm just lucky enough that you're gonna use it. I created an open source project. I was afraid of releasing it, it was called Cubicorn. The first day I released it, uh, it came to number one on GitHub for trending Go repositories. And to this day, it's being used by people all over the world. I was terrified of clicking the open source button. I didn't think people would like it. I thought it would piss people off. I thought my code was ugly. I wasn't proud of it. Turns out, it's actually one of the better solutions out there, and actually it's really approachable from an engineering perspective, because I spent so much time loving myself and valuing myself that, that it was reflected in my code. Good code comes from human connection. At the end of the day, when you write software, you write software to solve problems for humans. Why would you want your code to come in any other form? To me, the whole point of this talk is learning how to write elegant software. And I feel like the word elegant is one of those things you hear a lot, but I think needs to be defined. It's simple, it's clever, and it's personal. It's simple enough for you and me to walk up to it and understand it, but it's also clever enough to get the job done in a small amount of, uh, of work. We've all been in the situation where we looked at a function, and that function called a function, that called a function, that called a function, that called a function, that called a function, and before you know it, you have so many functions you give up, and you know somewhere in that mess of functions, uh, it might hit the kernel, or send an HTTP request, or something, but trying to find it is hard work. Keep it simple. Code also needs to be clever. There are a lot of solutions out there. You could do fun things with math or bitwise operators. And you can come up with elegant ways of organizing thoughts and ideas. And every time you write a function, it's an opportunity for you to do something clever or witty that you never thought of before. 
We should always try to write functions in any way. Code is personal. The code I wrote for Dave, I wrote for Dave. Nobody else but Dave. And now other people use it because if it was good enough for Dave, it's good enough for them. The big lesson here is that I loved myself. Because I loved myself, I was able to connect with other humans. Because I was able to connect with other humans, I was able to write lovely code for them. People use it everywhere today. Like I mentioned earlier in the talk, I climb mountains. But I think there's a bigger metaphor there that needs to be called out. My whole life has been filled with mountains. These monolithic, terrifying things in the future that you look at and you say, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to climb that thing. This is a picture of Little Bear in Blanca Peak. I climbed this about a month and a half ago. It's a class four. It's one of the dangerous mountains in the state. Uh, that is a snow and lightning storm on top that I was caught in while I was climbing this mountain. And I think regardless of if it's a mountain or it's a mountain of code or it's a mountain of dealing with your friends or family, I think you have to kind of approach it in small steps. So I like to think of problems in my software as mountains in my code. And when I go climb a mountain, it always starts off with the first step. So just take it one step at a time. You're going to be fine. It's all going to be OK. You're going to make it to the top. There's a saying in mountaineering that says, first you get to climb up, then you get to climb back down. So I'm Chris Nova, and I climb mountains.